I've been writing fiction since I was a child. Uh, I started very early writing stories, but that's not because I was planning to become a writer or an author someday. I didn't know such a thing was possible even. There were no authors around me. I think I started writing because I, I thought life was very boring, you know. I was an only child, I was a very solitary child. And uh, my upbringing was a little bit unusual. I was born in France, but then I came to Turkey with my mom. I was raised by two women, my mother and my grandmother. And um, I really thought real life wasn't as interesting and Storyland spoke to me and felt much more real and closer to my heart. That's how everything started. What has it meant for you that you were brought up with the two women? Mm -hmm. has that had, what influence had it had on your life? Mm -hmm. I think being raised by two women left a big impact on me. Um, on the one hand, because I didn't grow up in a stable family environment, maybe it also gave me a sense of being a little bit of an outsider. This is a feeling that I'm very familiar with. Maybe all throughout my life, I felt like an insider outsider, always on the periphery, somewhere on that threshold, which can be actually a good place for art, but it's a very lonely place for the artist, for the writer. On the other hand, I, I think one thing that left a big impact on me was they were very different, my mom and my grandma. Mom is very westernized, very secular, very modern, urban, rational. And grandma is pretty much the opposite. So she was more Eastern, more traditional, more spiritual, uh, less educated, but very wise, very wise in her own way. What stayed with me was the solidarity between these two women. I, I call that sisterhood. They did support each other through some really, really difficult times. And my grandmother very much supported my mother's education, independence. That was incredibly important for me to see that. I'm a big believer in sisterhood. I'm a big believer in the need for solidarity among women coming from different backgrounds. And the reason is because I have seen the impact of that solidarity. It goes beyond generations. So how do you practice that in your own life with this sisterhood? Is that something which goes through in your books or mm -hmm. the way you work or mm -hmm. the way you see the world? Yeah, I think individually we can have our own little successes, our own little strengths. That doesn't mean anything if we don't support each other, if we don't empower each other as women. Also, not only women, but to me, the solidarity among people who are, for any reason whatsoever, made to feel like outcasts or disempowered or disadvantaged. We need to change these power relations. So I'm someone who wholeheartedly believes in global solidarity. And I think we're living in a crucial time for that. So we need to go beyond our own little echo chambers. I also believe that in countries where women are divided, especially in countries where politics is aggressive, very divisive, in those countries, when women are divided, the only thing that benefits from that is patriarchy itself. In 2006, I wrote a novel called The Bastard of Istanbul. And this novel told the story of a Turkish family and an Armenian-American family. And the story was told through the eyes of women, generations of women, grandmothers, mothers, granddaughters. It is a book that deals with memory and amnesia. In Turkey, we have a very rich history, but at the same time, we are a society of collective amnesia. And this is a book that talked about 1915, the massacres, deportations, and uttered the word Armenian genocide. <clears throat> and after that, when the book came out, uh, I was put on trial. I was sued by ultranationalists. I was put on trial for insulting Turkishness, even though really nobody knows what that means. And uh, we have an article in our constitution, Article 301, that has been used against journalists and historians and scholars before. But this was the first time it was used as against the work of fiction. And as a result, my, the words of my fictional characters, mostly Armenian fictional characters, were plucked, were taken out of the book and used as evidence in the courtroom. Because of that, my Turkish lawyer had to defend my Armenian fictional characters in the courtroom. That madness went on for about a year, and in the end, we were all acquitted, me and the fictional characters. But even after that, I had to live with a bodyguard for about a year and a half. 
Now, fast forward, I, I wish I could tell you sitting here that since 2006, at least we have made progress and things got better and now we can write what we want. It's the opposite. We have been going even backwards and backwards. So it's hard for writers to write about politics. But what people sometimes fail to see is that it's equally difficult to write about sexuality and gender. The moment you start questioning these things, particularly as a woman writer, because the assumption in Turkey is a, a male novelist is primarily a novelist. Nobody talks about his gender. A woman novelist is primarily a woman. You will be looked down upon. You will be, people will try to remind you, you know, what you can't do. And you will be treated differently from the very beginning. And when a woman writer writes about sexuality, again, she will be treated differently. When a man writes about such issues, people think, but he's got a good imagination. When a woman writes about these issues, people think, oh, it's her story. This, this, is, this must have been her own personal life. As a result, if you do question sexual taboos, you will be personally accused of being immodest. So right now, um, so you have to deal with you know, a lot of personal attacks as a woman writer. Right now, some of my fiction is, uh, I'm not the only one, other authors as well, um, but is being investigated by a prosecutor to see if I have committed the crime of obscenity. Uh, a while ago, about two months ago, some police officers came to my Turkish publishing house and they required to see my fiction and also the books by um, an author called Duygu Asena, who was an iconic feminist. She passed away in 2006. She was one of our lead leading feminists. So her books, my books, have been taken to the prosecutor's office to see if there's a crime in those books. And the reason is because we write about issues such as gender um, violence, child abuse, uh, also um, rape, incest, such, such themes. When you write about these themes, you can be investigated or prosecuted. What is also happening, and this is new, through bots and trolls, thousands and thousands of them, you can one day wake up and like one morning I woke up, there was like 70,000 messages, bombardment, bots and trolls taking sentences out of a book saying oh, she wrote this, so she must be prosecuted and spreading that message. So there's that kind of pressure against authors as well. But doesn't that scare you? Of course it's scary, of course it's um, unnerving, but aren't we living, all of us, in very liquid times, like the late Sigmund Bauman told us we were? I think this is, you know, this kind of censorship, this kind of attack against culture, literature, storytelling is happening in front of our eyes. So we're not the only ones. Um, and I think as writers, we can only keep writing. I don't know whether we writers choose our themes or the themes come and choose us, you know, it's very um, irrational. But I do know one thing when I look at my books, and of course each and every one of them is very different because I was a different person. Books change us. I think they change something in hopefully in, our, in the readers, but also they change the writers as well. You're a different person when you start writing a novel, by the time you finished it, something has shifted inside your soul. So I'm very open to those changes. But I think there's one underlying current that I see um, among all these books, and that is a desire maybe to give more voice to people who have been voiceless, to bring the periphery to the center, maybe to make the invisible a little bit more visible, to change those power hierarchies, you know, to topple it uh, upside down. So I think all throughout my work, minorities have played an important role, whether it's ethnic minorities, cultural minorities or sexual minorities. And at the end of the day, I think, of course, storytellers are interested in stories and we love stories. But I think we should equally be interested in silences, the things we cannot talk about easily. And that also means taboos political taboos, cultural taboos, sexual taboos. There's a part of me that wants to open up a space where we can talk about these issues. I'm not trying to say this is the way you should think about these issues. That's not up to me. 
I think it's not a writer's job to try to find the answers, but it's a writer's job to ask the questions. Just difficult questions about difficult issues, create a space where you can have a multiplicity of voices heard. And then of course, always the answer is up to the reader. Every reader is going to read that story in their own way, bringing their own gaze into it. You know, if you happen to be an author from a wounded democracy, such as Turkey or Pakistan, Venezuela, Brazil, Egypt, Nigeria, imagine the, the list is so long and that list is getting longer. I think if you happen to be an author from such countries, you do not have the luxury of being non-political. You don't have the luxury of saying, you know, I'm only going to write my stories in my own room and close the curtains. I don't want to talk about what's happening outside the window. You have to talk about what's happening outside the window. I'm not saying we have to write political novels, but what is politics? We need to think about that carefully. I'm a feminist. One of the many, many wonderful things that I've learned from women's movements of past generations is it's very simple but very fundamental. Politics is not only about political parties, elections, parliaments. In our personal lives as well, there is politics. Wherever there is power, there is politics. So if you describe, if you define politics in such a broad way, again, you cannot be non-political. By this I mean, when you write about sexuality or gender, you can, you, that might be also a political act. So um, I think we have also entered an age after 2016, after Trump, after Brexit, after so much is changing and the rise of populist nationalism, perhaps more and more Western authors have begun to feel the same way. The urgency to respond to the events. To me, that's very interesting. You know, I think there are some core issues like rule of law, freedom of speech, democracy, minority rights, women's rights. There are lots of core democratic issues that we cannot be silent about. You also pay a price for doing what you're saying here. I mean, you know, you've been accused of uh, uh, insulting Turkishness in Turkey and you've been, you've been put on trial in Turkey. I mean, that's a very heavy price to pay. Why are you willing to do that? It's, I think I love stories, you know, I, I, that's the simple answer for me. I, I love writing, imagining, reading. So this is a world where I feel free, where I can be multiple. I think we all have multiple voices and selves inside us. We, but we're constantly suppressing some of those voices. But in the space of fiction, I can be free. All of those voices can come out. So to me, I think I associate literature with freedom, first and foremost. But primarily, because I'm writing novels, the novel is a very democratic space. I don't own that space as an author. I don't control that space, you know. When I start writing a story, it has its own rhythm, it has its own flow. Sometimes the language guides you, sometimes your characters guide you. You, you do not dominate over that space. So I think as fiction writers, we are maybe a little bit bolder in that space. Maybe we're even a little bit wiser than in our own daily lives. In our daily lives we're different people, you know, full of anxieties, panic attacks. But when you're writing a novel, you change, you use a different part of your brain. So there's a part of me that really loves and respects the art of storytelling. Uh, only when I give the book to my editor, then I start to worry about what people might say. But then, you know, if you think about these things too much, you cannot write, you cannot produce. And I think at the end of the day, art is about resistance. It is always a struggle. You always try to swim against the tide. You try to rehumanize people who have been dehumanized by mainstream narratives over and over. And this is a time, that is why we're living at a time in which art is even more important. Literature is even more important. And I think we need stories to connect us at an age when we're constantly being pushed into polarizations and tribes, artificial tribes. But do you actually feel that we're living at a time where novels can change the world? You know, I think novels can make their own little contribution and I, and I don't underestimate that because it's very interesting. As human beings, we always think, connect and remember in stories, right? 
Imagine, I mean, our own lives, what we remember, we remember through stories. How we think, how we respond, even to major issues like politics, we do it through emotions and through stories. And it's very unfortunate that in this age, populist demagogues understand that too well. And maybe it's very unfortunate that they're doing a better job in terms of connecting with people's emotions, addressing people's emotions, than their liberal counterparts. So I think we need to talk about emotional intelligence. Uh, I believe we underestimate emotions all the time, uh, especially people in the world of books, academia, media. We have to have a very frank rethinking about the importance of emotions and we need to increase our emotional intelligence. For me, it's very important to bring together the heart and the, the, heart and the mind. Politico chose me as one of the 12 people in 2017 who can give you a much needed lift of the heart, uh, maybe to make the world better hopefully. So that, that was, of course, very heartwarming for me to see that. Um, but I think stories can make the world better. And there's something that I find very important. When I read the works of people, the memoirs of people who have survived really dark chapters in human history, including the Holocaust, civil wars, genocides, there's a very crucial question they all raise. They're saying, how can such atrocities happen and their answer is not because there are so many bad people out there there are some bad people but relatively speaking their numbers are small but still bad things can happen so how is that possible and the answer they're giving us is that maybe the opposite of goodness is not necessarily evil or badness or wickedness they're saying the opposite of goodness is in fact numbness is the moment we become numb, indifferent, desensitized, disconnected from each other, the moment we stop feeling what the, the story of someone else living in another part of the world might be like, the moment we stop caring about someone else. So those are the thresholds that I find very dangerous. And in that regard, I think, literature can make a difference. At least it can punch holes in that wall of numbness that's being erected around us. And, and in, especially in your writing, I mean, what I feel when I'm reading your books is that you build like a bridge between East and West. I mean, you jump as if it was just like around the corner in time and space and boundaries. And is that like, is that your purpose with writing as well, that you're actually trying to build some kind of a bridge or some kind of a bridge of understanding between East and West? I think for me, water is a very important metaphor. You know, I like to think of rather than solid identities, I like multiple belongings, more fluid, you know, changing, flowing, always on a journey. And maybe in my writing, that also is my guide. So I like to question dualities. And there are lots of dualities that, that, that we are spoon fed constantly. East versus West, you know, men versus women, this versus that. And we're being told that they are, these are monolithic identities. Are they really? Where are the boundaries? How do we draw these cognitive boundaries? So I think it is the job of, of uh, storytelling to also show that reality is in fact much more layered, much more nuanced. Nuances are important. The, I, I find that very important. We, we live in a, at a time when we're constantly taught to debate in terms of us versus them. But for a writer, there is no us versus them. There is no other. In fact, the other is my brother. The other is my sister. The other is me. You know, so I think it's important for writers to question dualities all the time. You know, in 2017, Freedom House uh, issued a report showing that 35 countries around the world had made progress, which sounded like good news. But the next paragraph said 71 countries, twice as many, had been going backwards. All around the world, democracy is either declining or people are realizing that democracy is in fact much more fragile, much more delicate ecosystem than we assumed. 
And it's not enough to have elections, regular elections, to sustain a democracy. Of course, the ballot box is very important, but in addition to that, you need rule of law, separation of powers, definitely checks and balances. No one should have too much power in this world. Definitely free, diverse media, independent academia, women's rights, LGBT rights, together with all these components, a democracy can survive. Now, what we're seeing in country after country after country is that those components are being either damaged or broken completely. And I think this is something that should worry all of us. We cannot think or assume that some countries are immune to the rise of populist nationalism or toxic politics. No country is inoculated against that. No country is immune to that. We cannot assume that history always goes forward in a linear progressive way. That is not the case. If we have any knowledge of history, we can understand that time can sometimes go backwards or generations can make the same mistakes that their great grandparents had already made. And in my opinion, nationalism, tribalism, religious fundamentalism, any ideology that divides humanity into artificial tribes and sows the seeds of hatred, bitterness, antagonism, any ideology that does that is dangerous, is dogmatic, and unfortunately we're seeing a rise in such discourses and narratives, East and West. Turkey today has become the world's biggest jailer of journalists. In the past it used to be China and Russia, and now Turkey surpassed even that sad, dark record. Uh, and I think there has been a huge, of course, crackdown on civil society. Anyone who speaks differently, who dares to question the official narrative can be easily labeled as a traitor. Any, every writer, journalist, particularly for journalists, it has become much harder, but also for writers, academics, intellectuals. We all know that because of something you say in an interview, an article, a poem, even a retweet, you can be sued, you can be put on trial, almost lynched, you know, in digital platforms, but also in media or exiled or arrested. So there's always that knowledge at the back of our minds. Words have become heavy. Uh, but maybe precisely because of that, words are even more important. Um, Turkey has been going backwards with a bewildering speed. As the government became more inward looking, and as we have seen an increase in populist nationalism and populist authoritarianism, I think we have also seen an increase in sexism, in misogyny, in homophobia. These things always go hand in hand. Wherever there's an increase in ultranationalism, wherever the public space is dominated by authoritarianism, we will inevitably see an increase in sexism, misogyny, gender discrimination and homophobia, you know? So I think uh, we need to talk about how populist nationalism is not only anti-liberal or it's not only anti-pluralism, it's also, in my opinion, anti-women's rights, anti-minority rights, and eventually, in the long run, it's anti-democratic. And that doesn't only apply to what's happening in Turkey. It doesn't only apply to Turkey. It is happening in country after country. We see the same pattern. We see it in uh, Hungary, we see it in Poland, we see it in Venezuela, in Brazil. But we even see it at the same time in countries that were until recently regarded as solid Western democracies. So I think this is a danger that we should all be aware of, how the system, how democracy, liberal democracy can be broken from inside. This is why I think we live in an age in which we have to become more engaged citizens. We have to become more committed citizens. You know, Hannah Arendt used to talk about this and she used to warn us about this. If we become atomized, and two things are incredibly dangerous. One is anger. I know anger is a very sexy feeling and it makes us feel very high and on top of our game, but anger is toxic and it's repetitive. Anger won't get us too far. And the second thing we need to be aware of is apathy. You know, when we become disconnected, none of that helps. So I think we need to become more active, engaged citizens. We need to become more political, but I'm not talking about party politics. I'm not interested in that at all. I'm definitely not talking about partisan politics. What I'm talking about is being engaged when it comes to the danger of losing 
core democratic values like rule of law, like checks and balances, like free independent media and academia. If we can protect these institutions, we will all benefit from that space. When you lose that, the loss of democracy happens very, very fast. I think many people in the West, especially before 2016, um, assumed that we there are some countries in the world that are solid and safe and steady and then there are some other countries that are more liquid countries, more turbulent and you need human rights, struggle for human rights or freedom of speech or minority rights in those other lands that are still not achieved democracy yet. So there was a comfort, there was, um, there was too much comfort I think and people took it for granted. Now we know better, you know, now we look, look at what's happening in America, state after state, extreme abortion bills. There is a big backlash and a systematic backlash against women's rights, against LGBT rights and also against diversity, against pluralism. And we cannot be naive about this. I remember when I used to live in Istanbul, with all the good intentions, people telling me that it's very understandable for me to be a feminist because after all I lived in Turkey. And the American scholar who told me this never assumed that she also needs feminism in America, right? We need it everywhere. Patriarchy is universal. Yes, there are different degrees of patriarchy and in some countries maybe it's more visible, more intense, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist elsewhere. So now I think more and more people realize that actually we cannot take our rights for granted. They realize it even in the West. And we all need to put effort in order to keep pluralistic liberal democracy alive and improve it and think about inequality. It's the year 2019 and I think inequality has to be at the center of all of our thoughts and debates. How are people feeling left out, left behind? Where are the gaps? Where are the rifts? Whether it's economic, political, cultural or educational, we need to put thought into inequality and improve it and mend it and bridge it um, because it can't go on like this. One of the main challenges, challenges both within our society and globally uh, is the increasing gap between poor and rich, uh, resulting in conflicts and migration and wars. Um, do, do you believe that books or literature or writers have a word to say here? I think writers cannot turn a blind eye to inequality. We cannot ignore the gaps, the rifts, the fractures. Uh, and, and it's important, it's incredibly important. We cannot treat inequality like a side issue or a footnote. And it should matter to us because earlier we said that literature should give more voice to people who are voiceless, should try to bring the periphery to the center. At least for me, that's the way it is. So that means you care about the gaps, you care about inequalities. Uh, and that is why I think we live in an age in which fiction writers need to speak up more. And there's a paradox here. At an age when we talk about post-truth, whatever that means, or alternative facts, maybe fiction writers need to defend truth more loudly. So we've entered a very new era, I think, I believe, in world history, uh, in which artists, writers have to become more involved in the public space. And we should be able to talk about the consequences of extreme increasing inequality. And this is happening in front of our eyes. Why people feel left behind, left out? How does it happen? How does that hurt? And I'm not only talking about economic inequality, although that's a huge part of it, but I think we should also be able to understand and respond to cultural anxiety, demographic anxiety, political anxiety, um, and also these big educational gaps that, that are opening up in our societies. And one more big fracture, of course, is the one between the countryside and the cities. Yeah, so we have, to, we have to put more thought into how to mend these huge fractures. I'm an author and my struggle, my work is always through words. But I'm also an author who believes that uh, writers need to speak up, you know. We need to speak out in the public space. So when we do even events, what we talk about, how we talk, I mean, are we trying to help building walls? Are we trying to help building bridges? It's a very 
clear crossroads and I care about those bridges. So maybe an important part of my work is about trying to build bridges between different cultures, um, people who think about each other as the other, people coming from different walks of life and maybe try to show what, it, what we have in common but also think more carefully about the differences too so in a much more nuanced way when I do events I don't only stay in big cities I think it is unfair that most of our cultural and literary events are happening in big cosmopolitan cities but very little is happening in the countryside or in smaller towns we need to take out these literary conversations ideas and knowledge and empathy we have to spread you know compassion share it I think compassion is contagious creativity is contagious when I listen to you your words are going to inspire me maybe my words will inspire someone else but as human beings we always learn from each other I have um, I have a very diverse readership you know and this matters to me especially in a country like Turkey where everybody's divided into islands almost mental ghettos when I look at the people waiting in the line signing queue there are all kinds of people. Of course, there are lots of liberals, secularists, feminists, but also I have conservative readers. I have many readers wearing headscarves. I have readers who are Turks, Kurds, Alevis, Greeks, Jews, Armenians. All of that matters to me, you know. I think the doors of literature should be open to everyone. But that said, I do know that I, among my readers, there are people who are quite xenophobic. Some of them are, because this is the only narrative they hear at school, in the family, in the neighborhood. So if you ask their opinion about Armenians or Jews, they will tell you lots of stereotypes. Among my readers, there are people who are very homophobic or transphobic, because this is the only narrative they hear. But then they come and they say, you know, I've read your book and this is the character that I love the most, you know, that I identified with the most. And maybe the character they're talking about is Jewish or Armenian, or maybe that character is gay or bisexual or transsexual. So I thought about this a lot, you know, how is it possible that people who are more judgmental, more biased, more xenophobic, more homophobic in the public space, when they are reading a novel, when they're alone, not in the company of other people, when they're alone, when they retreat into that inner space and read a story, they become maybe a little bit more ready to connect with the other. Maybe just a notch, open mind, you know, a little bit more openness there. I really don't think it's a coincidence because um, when I look at authoritarian ideologies, all of them depend on collectivistic identity. You need to erase individuality for authoritarianism to flourish. You need synchronized energy. Yeah? What literature does is to restore our individuality, but not in a selfish way, not in a self-centered way, in a way that makes us remember that we're all human beings and what we have in common with our fellow human beings. So I think there is humanism at the, at the core of literature. And for me, to restore that individuality at a time when collectivistic identities are being promoted and sh pushed into, you know, um, sorry, at a time when collectivistic identities are being promoted constantly, to restore individuality to me is, is important. <laughs>